Thanks for joining us again. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we dive into Matthew 13, part two. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, uh, grateful for your love and grateful for your mercy and grateful, Father, for your patience with us. Father, going through the first couple of parables, God, it's, it's enlightening, God, of the challenges of really preparing our hearts to hear your word, uh, preparing our hearts to uh, receive the gospel of the kingdom. And I pray, Father, that we have done the work to prepare our hearts to hear what you have to hear, say to us today. Guide us and lead us, Father, and may you be glorified with the lives that we live. Be with those who are hurting and sick. Be with those, God, that need comforting. And not just here in the United States, but around the world. Not just here in our church, God, but your people all over the world. Father, we ask that we can see your kingdom expand and grow. And we just pray that as a church here in Valley Christian in Las Vegas, God, that we could be a part of the plan of bringing many to faith. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So again, I want to um, acknowledge the uh, Bema podcast of really being a, a great instrument 
uh, in helping us to, helping me to understand in a deeper level a lot of these parables that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 13. And prayerfully, I'll be able to communicate a lot of what I learned uh, to your benefit. So part two of Matthew 13, sacred secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Say that six times fast. All right. So we talked last week about the parable of the wheat and the weeds and the parable of the soils or the sower. And we ended with the question, why do you do what you do? Are you doing it because you're at the center of the motivation, my salvation, my comfort, my life? Or is Christ at the center of the motivation? As Paul says, I want to know Christ. Hopefully you've been able to answer that question with, I want to know Christ. That's why I'm a son or daughter of the kingdom, because I want to know Jesus. I I want to live like him. I want to speak like him. I want to be just like him on this earth and to be like him when we die. So we're going to go on. We're going to pick it up in Matthew 13, verse 31. Now, this is right after he told the wheat and the weeds parable. So I believe that verse 31 through 33 are parables to help explain the wheat and the weeds a little bit more. Not totally separate. Like I said, I don't believe all these things are separate. I believe there's a progression to them for a deeper understanding of the kingdom of God. Remember, it's so big. It's so awesome. It's so far beyond our full comprehension that he can't tell us what it is. He must tell us what it's like through parables, through through putting um, everyday objects next to the kingdom to compare to to draw out spiritual lessons. So in verse 31, he says, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flowers, I think that's like 60 pounds, till it was all leavened. Now, much shorter than the others, and so I know what you're thinking. You're like, this should be a shorter sermon, and it may be, but we'll see. I'm always down for miracles. So as you see in the pictures, you see that man holding a small mustard seed, um, and then you see the tree. Now, that's not a mustard seed. Uh, tree that would grow in Israel. Uh, there, that's a different one, but uh, it was hard to get a picture of that one. And then you see uh, dough that is risen because it's leaven. So what is this about? I believe that the kingdom is unassuming, right? It is just not um, flashy. It's Jesus didn't come with lots of money and a big old army. He didn't. Come, he man, He came and started his ministry at about 30 years old, after being a stone worker or a carpenter. He didn't go to the finest schools. He didn't, do any, he didn't show up in fancy. It was very unassuming. And so is his kingdom. His kingdom started with a small group of men and women and turned the world upside down. Why? It's unassuming, but it's also unstoppable. Jesus will say later on that the gates of Hades cannot overcome his kingdom and it grows remarkably just like uh, dough will rise and expand to many times its original size because of the leaven a mustard seed goes from one of the smallest seeds the smallest seed to a large tree and just like bread right 60 pounds three measures will feed and bless a lot of people. And just like that tree, that mustard tree, will be there a blessing to the birds, so will the kingdom. In in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 23 to 24, it says, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. 
And under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make, dry, make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. And so we see in this particular passage of Scripture, and like I talked about uh, in the last sermon, there are different levels of learning about uh, that's concerned with these parables. The, the very surfacey one that just comes out and smacks you. Well, what, what comes out and smacks us about the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven and the wheat? Hey, the kingdom of God's going to spread. The kingdom of God's going to grow. The kingdom of God is awesome. Well, we also have Old Testament passages associated with it. Why? Because these, the people listening to it are, is a Jewish audience that knows the Torah. And so when they hear certain words, they're going to think back on their learning. So, for instance, um, another passage in, in another place in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, was seen as a tree, and many people were blessed by him because that tree provided uh, shade and, and shelter and things like that. And we see the same thing with the kingdom of God, but even in a greater way. So what's the lesson? It's not only going to grow, it's not only going to be awesome, but it's going to be a blessing to the nations. Birds often represent people, but not necessarily the Jewish people, people around surrounding the Jews, Gentiles. And so in this parable, he's saying, hey, the kingdom of God is going to produce a kingdom that is going to bless all nations, not just the Jewish nation, not just the nation you're fond of, not just the people you know, but all nations. That's what this parable is saying. It's going to grow. It's unassuming. But man, it's unstoppable, and it's going to be a blessing to all nations. That is not what they thought the kingdom of God was going to be. They thought the kingdom of God was going to be a kingdom that was established on earth to overthrow Rome so the Jews can be back in power. And Jesus is saying, uh, that's not what this parable is about. This parable is about my kingdom that's going to be a blessing to all nations. He goes on in verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I believe these two parables are parallel. And they're not trying to teach two different lessons. I think they're trying to drive home the same lesson. Now, I know we've heard it. Uh, well, let me not assume. Many of us, when we read this parable, we think about the kingdom of God being the treasure, the kingdom of God being the pearl, and us being the merchant, and us being the man. So I... I made a table, for those of us who are kind of nerdy that way, we need tables to explain stuff. I made a table about answering the question, who's the man or who's the merchant? Who's who in the parables? And what's interesting is in all, a lot of the other parables, if not all the other parables, the man, the, the, the farmer, the sower, it's, it's God or Jesus. Um, God mostly in particular. And so I want to look at it, what if the man and the merchant, both of them are God? What does that mean? So if the man who, is looking, who found the treasure, the merchant who found the pearl is God, then the treasure would be his people. If you read Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter uh, 16, 1 through 14, Exodus 19, 5a, and Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, what you're going to find is in, 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 in Exodus and Deuteronomy, God calling his people his treasure among all the nations. 
What you're going to see in Ezekiel 16 is God finding Israel. And, and, and the analogy is used as a baby kicking in its own blood that has been rejected, and God finds it. God rescues her. God cares for her. God brings her to growth. He, he brings her to adulthood. And he adorns her. He, he showers her with, with jewelry, with the finest gifts. And so, now remember, this isn't written to us. So we, we sit here and say, Israel, it should be me. But remember, it's written to a Jewish audience. And so for God to see Israel as a treasure, as a fine pearl, it would make sense because that would relate back to the Old Testament. The reason why I say God's people is because we know the other parables talk about a kingdom that is blessing all people. And so God sees his people as a treasure, worth everything. Wow. What an incredible story of God's love. What an incredible parable of, of sitting back and, and saying, man, I'm, I'm part of that treasure that God gave up everything for. Now, if we look at it, where the man or the merchant is you, has slightly different implications. The treasure becomes God's kingdom. Why? Because we, we stumble upon it, right? It's a treasure. It's in the, the field is the world. We find God's kingdom in the midst of this world, and we realize it is worth everything that we have. It is worth everything. It's that valuable. God's kingdom is the pearl that we're looking for. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about not storing up treasures here on earth. Talks about in, in later in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you, but the greatest thing of value is his kingdom and his righteousness. He talks about where our treasure is. That's where our heart will be. So me personally can't be dogmatic one way or the other. My good friend Dave Tam and I, we had a long talk about, about this particular parable, and it was a great talk. And in studying it out more, it's, it's hard to be dogmatic about one or the other. I have my, you know, leanings of which one I think is more accurate or, 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 or inaccurate, and, and it really doesn't matter. I think what you want to see here is that Either way, God sees his people as valuable. We see his people, his kingdom as valuable, worth everything. The question really for us, is there anything more valuable in our lives? Are we, are we wooed by God's love for us to serve him and to give him everything? Are we so blown away about his kingdom that we're willing to give up everything else in pursuit of it? Those are the real questions. I don't care how you slice it, how you dice it. It comes down to what's our response? What was their response? Some gave their lives for the kingdom. Others rejected it outright. We have that same choice. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven it's like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him. Uh, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. Now, what's intense about uh, this particular um, parable is the imagery. Jesus is talking to some people who are fishermen. They understand this concept. 
in Mark chapter 1, and in, I think it was in Matthew, what did Jesus, I think it was Matthew 4, 19, Jesus approached the disciples and says, hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to go catch men. And here you have a parable of the same ilk. In Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 10, God says, Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Eneglim, it will be a place from, for spreading of the nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Even in the Old Testament, there's an imagery of casting a net and catching fish of every kind. Why? God has always wanted to be the God of all nations. Always. And that's what that net, that the kingdom, is a net being cast all around the world to get as many as possible. Now, in that net are good and bad fish. Any other parable remind you of that? Yeah, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And guess who separates them out? And when do they separate them out? It's the angels, and it's at the end of time and judgment day. Now, what's really intense is a lot of times when we talk about, you know, God's people, we, we, we always talk about them going somewhere, them, them uh, being raptured, them, them going somewhere. But here, it's the evil that goes somewhere, and the righteous stay. It's just interesting to think about. He talks about a fiery furnace, and we can relate that back to Daniel, the Hebrew children, you know, why, what was the purpose of the fiery furnace in Daniel? It was to throw everyone in there who didn't bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar. What's the fiery furnace for in this parable? To throw everyone in it who does not bow down and worship God. Who, did, who does not make Jesus basically the Lord of their life, the king of their lives. So it's a pretty intense parable. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but bottom line is, it comes down to the same concept. There are good, there are bad. We who are good, it's not our job to determine who is bad. That's the angel's job. Doesn't that alleviate you of all the pressure of needing to be judgmental? Now, I think we need to be discerning, right? Uh, I, I think we need to um, be wise but we also need to understand we're not judge and jury of people. That's, that's God. What are we called to do? Love them. We're called to preach the truth and to love people. We're not to commend them to heaven or condemn them to hell. Not our job. Our job, our purpose is to love God, is to serve him and to do his will. So I love this next passage where he says, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Think about this. Some of the people in the crowd, some of the people listening to Jesus know the Torah, the Old Testament, front to back. And Jesus is giving them the key. Jesus is the key to fully understanding those scriptures. And he says, someone who has been trained in the scriptures, when they follow Jesus, they have old treasure that they've stored up by studying the Old Testament, by studying the Torah, and they have all this knowledge. And now Jesus comes along. He unlocks so much more. And now they have new treasure. And so they're able to share the old treasure. Hey, guys, this is what you've always known. This is what you've always been taught. Let me share with you the new treasure, Jesus Christ. For us, I'm not a scribe. I've not been trained for the kingdom of heaven. So I'm not sure this is totally applicable to me or totally applicable to you. But for us, it's all new treasure. The thing that I feel challenged by is to learn what's the Old Treasure. We spend so much time in the New Testament, we don't know the Old Testament. And so I think we're handicapped in knowing the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom, the fullness of the gospel. Now, I think we know a lot, but there's so much more 
to be discovered. And I want to encourage us to, to, to do the work, to do the work to know the life we are called to live, to do the work to be that soil that is plowed, ready for the gospel of the kingdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 5 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge, find the knowledge of God. I think God wants us to be so much more hungry to to, to discover the, the awesomeness of his word, the depths of his word. I'm afraid that many of us, we're just happy to hear a sermon for, for me to do the work for you. Do the work. Do the work yourself to dig deep into God's word. As it were, silver, hidden treasure, so that you can understand the fear of God. Verse 53, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his, his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know what is pretty intense is Jesus went home and they rejected him. Not only did they reject him and question him, they were offended by him. Offended. The Greek word is a, the root word for scandalized. They were scandalized. It, they, they were like, who is this guy? They didn't even refer to him in his proper lineage by his dad, but by Mary, which is to, 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 to really demean him even more. And he says a prophet is without honor in his, in his hometown and amongst his own people or his own family, household. I believe the lesson here goes back to what Jesus said, who are my mother, my brothers, my sisters? Those who do the will of God are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. I think it comes back to do we value the family of God? I think it comes back to, as Nadine shared in her minutes of motivation last week, are we better together? Are we living that way? See, this pandemic has served to possibly and potentially divide us, separate us, to make us not as close. Why? It takes work. It takes creativity. It takes, you know, finagling how we can be together, how we can be connected during this time. Yes, there's technology, but there's a good old-fashioned getting together face to face, six feet apart, with masks on if necessary, of just seeing each other and getting together. I want to encourage you to fight for that. Why? I remember my parents used to say, no one's going to love you like your family. And I believe to a degree that's true. But what should be even more true is no one's going to love you like God's family. And we got to live up to that. Why? Because Jesus is our brother if we're doing the will of God and we want to do our brother and our father proud. I want to share with you a quote from this one guy. Some say he's pretty smart, but I think the verdict is still out. It says, familiarity may not breed contempt, but it can diminish one's sense of awe. You know, the people in Jesus' hometown, 
were very familiar with him. We know that they knew his mom, they knew his brothers, they knew his sisters, they knew he grew up, they knew, you know, his batting average in high school baseball. They knew all these things about Jesus. And you know what? He did miracles, he did wonders, he did signs, and they weren't impressed. Because they were so familiar with him, they wanted to know, where did he get all these teachings? Where did he he get all this stuff? We know where you're from. We know your family. We're offended that you're saying saying what you're saying, that you're doing what you're doing. Their sense of awe was severely diminished because of their familiarity. What about us? Are we still amazed by Jesus? When we read the scriptures, are we amazed? Or are we like, oh, he did a miracle. Ah, oh, he raised someone from the dead. Ah, oh, he healed someone's hand. Ah, oh, that happens every day. That doesn't happen every day. It didn't happen every day then. It doesn't happen every day now. When we read this, we should be amazed that, that, that God the Son robed himself in flesh, walked among us and left us his teachings so that we may follow? Are we still amazed? Or are we offended by Jesus? Are we offended by the teaching of deny self, of lay down your life, of consider others better than yourself? Are we offended by the the teachings of be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, loving your enemies, loving those and blessing those who want to do harm to you? Are we offended by the teachings of Jesus, because it does not agree with our philosophy of life? Are we apathetic about Jesus? Do we come in and in the church, listen online, do all these things? I heard a friend said, Satan doesn't mind you going to church, just as long as you don't do anything that you're called to do. Satan doesn't mind you giving your tithes, giving all these things. He doesn't mind you going to church, just as long as you don't get anything out of it. Are we apathetic? Do we still see a lost world that needs saving? Do we still want to advance God's kingdom? Do we still want to win people, quote unquote, to Christ? Do we still want to share our faith? Do we still want to have an impact? Do we still have passion about Jesus, about his word, about his family, about things about him and of him and for him and through him? Do we still have that passion? Are we inspired? By Jesus. Does Jesus inspire you when you read how he lived, how he sacrificed, how he loved, how he gave? Doesn't it inspire you? Does it inspire you to go and imitate? You know, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and said, go and do likewise. Does that inspire us to be servants? Does it inspire us when Jesus says, hey, the greatest among you shall be your slave? Does that inspire us to give our lives to service in the kingdom of God? You know, as we take communion together, uh, I wanted to read a passage of Scripture. And it's from the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 4 through 7. And it reads, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Now listen to this description. From Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And he has, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You say, that's the communion, that's the communion passage? That's a communion passage. Why? That should fill you with awe. That is who set us free. That is who sacrificed his life for us. Why? To be a kingdom and priests. 
to be those people that go between God and man to bring them to God. In verse 7, it says, Look, he is coming with, uh, with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I think that mourning comes because they refused to acknowledge who he was while he was on earth. They rejected him. I believe his people will be rejoicing because we know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. As we take communion, I pray that we can be in awe of our Savior, in awe of what he has done, in awe of what he is doing, and in awe of his coming. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we take communion. Father God, thank you. We look forward to that day when we can be with you in heaven forever. Where we can have uninterrupted, uncorrupted fellowship with Jesus Christ. But until that day, I pray that we will continue to fight the good fight. That we will continue to lay down our lives. Seek to be with you. Seek to please you. Seek to love you more and more. And seek to love our brothers and sisters more and more deeply, loving them from the heart. Be with us, God, during this time of communion. Help us to always do it in remembrance of Jesus. His sacrifice, his body broken, his blood spilled, and his resurrection as we look forward to his return. Father, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless, and we'll see you next time.